Good evening. I want to thank Trace for that prayer. Although I can assure you, I always have a relaxed mind. <laughs> this is not necessarily a good thing, but uh, so a little bit different tonight. Um, Gene always sets up my PowerPoint, and I said, I do not have a PowerPoint tonight. And he goes, because I always have a PowerPoint. So a little bit different, but uh, I'm going to make you work tonight because we're going to look up scriptures together and read from his word. So I entitled this, uh, this lesson, And the Children Shall Lead. Now, this is the, t uh, the title of the same, uh, it's a Star Trek episode, season three, episode four, okay? So now just to set the record straight, I am a Trekker. I am not a Trekkie, and I'll tell you the difference. A Trekker is a Star, a Star Trek enthusiast, enjoys the shows, can quote dialogue, enjoys exchanging trivia about the shows and the movies. A Trekkie is someone who attends conventions, wears costumes, learns Klingon, and even gets married in a Starfleet uniform. So uh, I am not a Trekkie. I went to a convention one time and I was terrified. It was the scariest thing. I've, combat wasn't as scary as going to a Star Trek convention. So, um, so the premise of the movie, or a correction of this uh, episode, is that uh, all the adults on this on this Federation planet are killed, uh, and the children uh, don't care, and they're they're just playing and stuff like that. And there's a uh, alien that's brainwashed the children into trying to take over and even take over the Enterprise and stuff like that. Now that has nothing to do with tonight's sermon, but that's just a little bit of backstory. Okay, so I got to thinking about children. And, you know, on how uh, they've had integral part in um, the various uh, scriptures. Doing a, quick, uh, doing a quick search, the word child is mentioned 145 times in the New American Standard Bible. And children is mentioned 314 times. And as I mentioned before, anything that's mentioned a lot generally has a lot of importance to God. Uh, the scriptures say that children are a blessing. However, I'm not sure if it's talking about teenagers uh, because they sometimes try our patience when they, when they get to that age or even older. The uh, Bible says that a uh, man that has many children, his quiver is full and it's a blessing to him. And uh, women are blessed by the fruit of the, the womb and such like that. So children is very important to God. And it even says in the scriptures that uh, the, ch the, the kingdom of heaven belongs to children, and uh, unless we are like children, we will never enter the kingdom. So, we're going to do some uh, uh, study in the scriptures. Uh, there's a lot in the Old Testament about um, children or younger people that has done great things. Now, the term child or children is relative. I'm 59 years old, and I'm still the baby, according to my mom. So it's hard to, when you raise a child, you know, to think of uh, anything but they're your children, okay? So when it says in the, in the Bible, it talks about youthfulness or children or something like that, it's not necessarily meaning a little shaver. It could be someone that is younger, because especially in those times, uh, a younger individual was considered not as experienced, not as knowledgeable, not as wise as someone that has, has uh, lived longer on the earth. Now, though we don't have a scripture reading on Sunday night, the scripture reading I have for uh, tonight's theme is uh, very, very uh, common. You, you know it well. 1 Timothy 4 and 12 is where Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says, Let no one look down on your youthfulness, but rather in speech, conduct, love, faith, and purity, show yourself an example to those who believe. So we're going to, Timothy is going to be one of them we're going to talk about tonight, but we're going to start uh, with David. Now I invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 17. And I got my uh, faithful 
paper Bible tonight. 1 Samuel chapter 17. We're going to read through this together. And this is the story about David and Goliath. Okay? And, and David was a youth at this time. Starting in verse 17, read through here. It's quite a long read, but chapter 17 and verse 1. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they were gathered at uh, Syak, which belongs to Judah, and they camped between Syak and Azaiah and Ephah's Daman. Saul, which is the king, and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on one side while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was uh, clothed with a scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze greaves on his legs and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of the spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. He stood and shouted at the ranks of Israel and said to them, why do, you come, why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and your servants of Saul? And you servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then I will become your servants. We will become your servants, rather. But if I prevail against him and kill him, you will become our servants and serve us. And the, again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that, will, that we may fight together. When Saul and all of Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now David was the son of the Ephraimite of Bethlehem in Judah whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three younger, three older sons, rather, of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him was Anabadah. I can't get that one. And the third was Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul. But David went back and forth from Saul to tend his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine came forward moving or morning and evening for forty days and took his stand. Then Jesse said to David, Take now for your brothers an ephah of this roasted grain and these ten loaves, and run to the camp to your brothers. Bring these ten uh, cuts of cheese to the commander of their thousand and look into their welfare of your brothers and bring back news of them. For Saul, they had all the men of Israel are in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. So David arose early in the morning and left the flock from the keeper and took the supplies and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the circle of the camp while the army was going out in battle array shouting the war cry. Israel and Philistines drew up in battle array army against army. Then David left his baggage in the care of the baggage keeper and ran to the battle lines and entered in order to greet his brothers. As he was talking with them, behold, the champion of the Philistine from Gath named Goliath was coming up from the army of the Philistines and he spoke these words and David heard them. When all the men of Israel saw the man, uh, the man, they fled from him, from him and were greatly afraid. The men of Israel, have you seen this man who's coming up? Surely he is coming up to defy Israel, and he will, uh, and he will be that the king will enrich this man who kills him with riches 
and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. And David spoke to the, man, uh, to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for this man who kills the Philistines and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine, that he should taunt the armies of the living God? David was a young man, and he could not believe that these mighty fighting men were standing afraid. And David's like, what are you doing? He is, he's, cause, he's, he's calling reproach upon Israel. So later as the story goes on, David, as a boy, was going to go into battle. Why? Because he knew God was on Israel's side. A boy. And all these men of Israel, these fighting men, Warriors wouldn't do it. They tried to put the, all the armor, the king's armor on him, and it weighted him down. He says, no, 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 I'm not going to do that. So he just went into battle with five smooth stones. And it only took one. And David slew Goliath. How could we do that? Could we do that as a boy, as a young person? David was so confident and had such faith in his God that he said, no, this is not going to happen. David was, this is just the start of David's career in the Bible, but he, he, he shows that even as a young age, he had the wherewithal and the confidence in his Lord that the Lord would deliver him. That is a dedication to God that wouldn't, uh, that we would probably feign at it. We, we would uh, hope to have. Now we're going to turn to Daniel. Please turn to Daniel chapter 1. Daniel chapter 1. Where is it? There we go. I'm so used to being able to poke my iPad and it goes right to it. Daniel chapter 1. Now, Daniel, uh, his Babylonian name was Belshazzar, which is interesting because he was always mentioned as Daniel, whereas his three friends were mentioned as their Babylonian names. So, Jan Daniel chapter 1, starting at verse 3, we're going to read through verse 21. Daniel 1, 3. Then the king ordered Aphanabaz, uh, the chief of his officials, to bring in some of the sons of Israel, including some of the royal family and the nobles, youths, youths in whom was no defect, who were good-looking, showing intelligence in every branch of wisdom, endowed with understanding and discerning knowledge, and who had ability for serving in the king's court. And he ordered them him to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king appointed uh, for them a daily ration from the king's choice food and from the wine which he drank, and appointed that they should be educated three years, and at the end of which they were to enter the king's personal service. Now among them from the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hamaniah, Mishael, and Azariah. Then the commander of the officials assigned new names to them, and to Daniel he assigned to the name Belshazzar, and to Hananiah, uh, Shadrach, and to Misha, Mishael, uh, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Verse 8. But Daniel made up his mind that he would not defile himself with the king's choice food, or with the wine which he drank. So he sought permission from the commander of the officials that he might not defile himself. Now God granted Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the commander of the officials. And the commander of the officials said to David, I am afraid of my lord the king who has appointed your food and your drink. For why should he see your faces looking more haggard than the youths who are your own age? Then you would make me forfeit my head to the king. But Daniel said to the overseer, whom the commander of the officials had appointed over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah, 
Please test your servants for ten days, and let us be given some vegetables to eat and water to drink. Now let our appearance be observed in your presence, and the appearance of the youths who are eating the king's choice food, and, the, and, the deal, and deal with your servants accordingly to what you see. So he listened to them in this matter and tested them for ten days. At the end of the ten days, their appearance seemed better and were uh, fatter than all the youths who had been eating the king's choice foods. So the overseer continued to withhold their choice food and the wine they were to drink and kept giving them vegetables. As these four youths, God gave them knowledge and intelligence in every branch of literature and wisdom. Daniel even understood all kinds of visions and dreams. Then at the end of the days when the king had specified for presenting them, the commander of the officials presented them before Nebuchadnezzar. The king talked with them, and out of all of them, no one was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. So they, so they entered the king's personal service. As for every matter of wisdom and understanding about the king consulted them, he found them ten times better than all the magicians and conjurers who were in his realm, and Daniel continued until the first year of Cyrus the king. So here we have Daniel, a youth. Not exactly sure how old he was, but he is... Uh, they, they were uh, brought into Babylonia and Babylon, and then they're prisoners. But he stood up to them and says, No, I'm not going to defile myself. This is a young person standing up for what he knew was right and did not want to defile himself with the king's choice foods and wine. And God blessed him for it because of his faithfulness. Now let's look at a little bit of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Turn over a page or two to Daniel chapter 3 and verse starting in, let's look at, let's uh, start in verse 1 here. Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made uh, an image of gold, the height of which was 60 cubits, and its width 6 cubits. He set on it the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon. Then Nebuchadnezzar, the king, sent word to assemble the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces to come to the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the satraps, the prefects, and the governors, and the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, and the magistrates, and all the rulers of the provinces were assembled for the dedication of the image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Then the herald loudly proclaimed, To you the command is given, O peoples, nations, and men of every language, that at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, flute, lyre, trigon, uh, solitary, bagpipe, and all kinds of music, you are to fall down and worship the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king has set up. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall immediately be cast into the midst of the fire and bla uh, the furnace and the blazing fire. Therefore, at that time, when all the people had heard the sound of the horn, flute, the lyre, the trigon, the solitary, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, all the peoples, nations, and men of every language fell down and worshipped the golden image that Nebuchadnezzar the king had set up. For this reason, at that time, certain Chaldeans had come forward and brought charges against the Jews. They responded and said to Nebuchadnezzar the king, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that every man who hears the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the psaltery, and the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, is to fall down and worship the golden image. But whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast into the midst of the furnace of blazing fire. There are certain Jews whom you have appointed over your administration of the province of Babylon, namely Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. These men, O king, have disregarded you. They 
do not serve your God, God or worship the golden image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and anger, gave orders to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Then these men were brought before the king. Nebuchadnezzar responded to them, Is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the golden image that I have set up? Verse 15. Now, if you are ready, at the moment you hear the sound of the horn, the flute, the lyre, the trigon, the solid tree, the bagpipe, and all kinds of music, to fall down and worship the image that I have made very well. But if you do not worship, you will immediately be cast into the midst of the fire, furnace of blazing fire. And what God is there who can deliver you out of my hands? Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied to the king, O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to give you an answer concerning this matter. If it be so, our God, whom we serve, is able to deliver us from the furnace of blazing fire, and he will deliver us out of your hand, O king. But even if he does not, let it be known to you, O king, that, you are not, that we are not going to serve your gods, or worship the golden image that you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was filled, filled with rage. His facial expression was altered toward Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He answered by giving orders to heat the furnace seven times more than it usually heated. He commanded certain valiant warriors who were in his army to tie up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in order to cast them into the furnace of blazing fire. Then these men were tied up in their trousers, their coats, their caps, and other clothes, and were cast in the midst of the furnace of the blazing fire. For this reason, the king, because the king's command was urgent and the furnace had been made extremely hot, the flame of the fire slew those men who carried up Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. But these three men, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, fell in the midst of the furnace of blazing fire still tied up. Then Nebuchadnezzar was astounded and stood up in haste, and he said to his high officials, Was it not three men we cast bound into the midst of the fire? They replied to the king, Certainly, O king. He said, But look, I see four men loosed, walking about in the midst of the fire without harm, and the appearance of the fourth is like the Son of God's. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, as their Babylonian names, were young men, not exactly sure how old. And again, they were in a foreign country. You don't tell a king no. And yet they had the fortitude and the courage because of their God to say, we don't owe you an answer. And they said, if we die, we die. But our God, we're not going to defy him. We're not going to disobey him. And we're not going to worship your gods or do what you tell us. That takes a lot of courage, folks. And these are young people. Now let's talk about one last individual in the Old Testament, Hezekiah. This is in 2 Kings chapter 18. 2 Kings chapter 18. The shorter read. Second Kings chapter 8, the first six verses. Now it came about in the third year of Hosea, the son of Elah, king of Israel, that Hezekiah, the son of of Ahaz, king of Judah, became king. He was 25 years old when he became king, and he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abby, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that his father David had done. He removed the high places and broke down the sacred pillars and cut down uh, the Asherah, he broke into pieces the bronze servant that Moses had made, for until those days the sons of Israel burned incense to it, and it was called uh, Nebushtan. 
He trusted in the Lord, the God of Israel, so that after him there was none like him in all the kings of Judah, nor among those who were before him. For he clung to the Lord, he did not depart from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord had commanded Moses. Now, 25 is pretty old when you're looking at younger, when little kids are looking at it. Most of us are a lot older than that, but that's still pretty young. And a very young king, he did what was right in God's eyes. He tore down the high places, he tore down the Asherah, and he returned uh, Israel back to obeying God. That is amazing for a young person to do. Now let's turn to the New Testament in Timothy. Now, in referencing Gene's evening sermon on 1 Timothy on March 5th, Timothy was an older boy or a young man, possibly a teenager, when he was converted. And as Gene pointed out, tradition holds that Timothy died in, uh, at or around AD 97 at the age of 80, and that would put him being born about AD 17. And in uh, Acts 16, verses 1 through, P, uh, 1 through 3, rather. It reads, Paul also came to Derbe and to Lystra, and a disciple was there named Timothy, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brethren who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go up with him. And he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those parts for they knew that his father was a Greek. And as, uh, as I glean from Gene's sermon, estimating Paul, when Paul went on a second missionary journey, uh, Timothy would have been probably mid-20s, maybe uh, early 30. When Paul saw something in this young man, and he wanted to bring him along. And that says a lot about a young man, Timothy, that they said he was well uh, spoken of in Lystra as well as Iconium, which is not his area. And Timothy was most like an elder at the church of Ephesus. So he started at a very young age in the church, and he became a very good disciple. Titus was another youth that uh, Paul recognized that he was someone that could have a good impact and a, and a strong uh, change in the church. Titus also became a strong leader in the early church, specifically working with the church established in the island of Crete, establishing elders there as well as elders in other congregation. And Paul tasked, tasked Titus with several things, which shows Paul had full confidence in him, even though he was a younger individual. I don't think, I know that I have a tendency that when you see someone young, he's like, well, they're, they're really, I don't know if I really want to trust them to do something. But I really think that we need to cultivate our younger people. It's said that children are our future. And recently I was uh, driving and there was a Church of Christ. I don't remember where, what it was, what it was but it was between... Uh, 96th Street off of I-69 and 82nd Street, and now it's a different, it's a denomination. So yet another church has, has died. And there's congregations that we send, send men up there to preach, and they're getting older and older. The uh, congregation where you all went when you were in, in Platt area, very, very old. If we do not glean and we do not mentor and train and encourage our young people churches are going to be dying now it will never die away we know that but we're getting smaller and smaller okay we have a small congregate or we have a small gathering here tonight a few younger people i really like to see when dylan and you know reads the scripture and stuff like that we need to uh teach, train, mentor these young people, encourage them to 
continue on their way if they're not if they're not uh, Christians to help them to give them good examples. We need to glean these young people to become our future future church. In the way of an habitation, uh, if you're not a Christian, or if you have uh, strayed away, or if you need need uh, prayers of the congregation, whatever your needs are, we ask you to please take the opportunity, make them known as together we stand and sing.